Welcome everybody to this symposium. My name is Fiona Llewellyn. I'm the Senior Project Manager in the Marine Conservation Team at ZSL, and I'll be chairing the first session today. So this symposium was originally put together by myself and my colleague, Shrishti Patel, who also works in ZSL's Marine Conservation Team, really with the aim of sharing the message of systems change for ocean conservation and exploring the application of systems change approaches to the global environmental threat of ocean plastic pollution. So over the next two days, we want to review, inform, challenge and inspire a broad international audience in this new approach to science, practical conservation and sustainability. So to do this, we're going to be hearing from a fantastic lineup of 29 speakers from a range of backgrounds, expertise and experiences. We will investigate the human values and broken systems to, that have led to this major environmental challenge of plastic pollution and explore the global work underway to address and mitigate it, including emerging systems change approaches and interventions. I've got the hard task of opening this symposium and it's lovely to see Fiona again because we've worked together for many years. Um, I'm going to frame up what is systems change, give you kind of quite a conceptual uh, bigger view. Uh, and then my colleague, Shauna Jordan, who works at ZSL on One Less will give you more of a practical example of how we applied that to the One Less project as well. So hopefully you'll get kind of different levels of understanding of what systems change is. So what is this systems change? What is the emerging science and practice of systemic change? And what could this mean for conservation? Uh, what does this mean for people who are working within this field? And I wanna start with kind of giving a bit of my background and where, how I came into systems change. So actually I worked for WWF many eons ago. Um, and when we started our systems change practice at WWF, um, it was really kind of the, the line of impact from how we were saving, sort of conserving and working with the animals, such as the iconic panda, thinking about their habitats, the forest in which they lived in, so to working on forestry programs, but really appreciating that some of the root causes of, of forest de deforestation was to do with production and consumption and um, how we were using the timber. So really recognising that we needed to work on consumption patterns in order to affect change in the forest for the animals. But actually the systems change piece and the work that we were doing, we initiated a number of different projects. So I work very much in the education systems change. How do we change um, how we educate, not just what we educate, but how we educate. How do we change the finance system, the transport system? We are working on community systems and we were also working um, uh, it was from that place, uh, Common Cause was set up, a, a values-based organisation. So we were trying to look at some of these root causes that were impacting on the work. So hopefully um, today I will take you through kind of how do we see underneath the surface? How do we see what is needed to do, to take, to do systems change? As Fiona said, I worked um, for the last eight years at Forum for the Future mm -hmm. on the Marine Collab. Um, and one less project, which were using systems change approaches uh, to creating change in conservation. But I've also worked on a number of projects across the social environmental sector, um, um, across businesses, foundations and civil society as well. And the School of Systems Change, as Fiona said, is really trying to bring this systems change approach to build capacity of change makers and really coaching and using that. And so I bring um, and bring the perspectives of what some of the principles of systems change are, but really this builds on the legacy of multiple actors, multiple practitioners, multiple frameworks and tools, and really trying to give you an overview. So, so at the School of Systems Change, we very much are trying to bring multiple tools and approaches to how we create change. So where do we start? Uh, where do we start with this question? What is impactful and effective change making? This is the question that I started many, many years ago when I was working at WWF. How do we understand how we create effective change? And a lot of the premise of systems change, as I say, is going to the root cause, is going to the underlying worldviews, values, um, ideas that affect how we view our relationships, how we view power dynamics. It has a ripple effect into decisions and practices that we, that we undertake, the policies and also the flows of resources. So when we're looking at issues like plastic, when we're looking at marine conservation, um, it actually, as we would argue, needs to start with worldviews. What are the deeper worldviews that affect how we create change and affect the outcomes that we see in the world? 
And a lot of those worldviews, as we currently understand it, in the, in the practice of science and the history of that has been from a Newtonian paradigm, a way of seeing the world where we describe the results as linear cause and effect chains. Uh, very simply put, I know there's more behind it as well. This led to reductionism, the need to break down things into simple components and linear relationships. But as we know that a lot of these challenges that we're facing, climate change obviously being one of the biggest, that this reductionism doesn't necessarily help us address the issue of global problems with multiple causes, multiple intersecting parts. And so this was the birth of systems thinking, systems change, the need to think of things beyond reductionism into a more holistic and whole view. So the world, it kind of recognises systems change, that the world is a complex and interconnected, finite. It is not just um, ecological, it is also social, psychological and economic system. This is the critical thing, this is one of my favourite slides. We treat it as if it's not. We treat it as if it is divisible and separable and infinite. And so a lot of these intractable problems arise directly from this mismatch, the way we see the world and the way we act in the world and the way that the world works. So that, that kind of is my first point, is that system change really is also trying to uncover what are the deeper worldviews, the mental models, the values that affect our change making and affect how we understand uh, change making such as conservation. So it informs how we understand systems. It informs when we're trying to do analysis and understand some of the problems. So we might have a systems view that is mechanical, that tries to find objective truth. And that is all, this is, none of this is wrong. None of this is the wrong or right way of seeing the world. It's just saying there are also different worldviews that underlie kind of, even when we think about systems and, and understanding it, that, that we can find um, cause and effect, that we can maybe start mapping the system in a more complex way from that cause and effect, not as a linear thing, but as, a, as an interrelated map. That, that systems are, are hard and known and that we can start mapping them. But what I want to suggest today is that we also need to understand system not just from this objective truth place, but also um, a complexity view asks us to think of them also, not, not just also as subjective, that, they, that we are socially constructing our world, that a lot of these um, environmental and, and conservation issues are actually due to our social systems, due to the consumption, the production of the world, how we're looking at it. So we need to look at more softer systems methods of critical thinking of how things are complex and non-linear. But also, and this is, this is where the two come together, we need to take a living systems perspective. And this is where I really come from and where actually where those who work on ecological issues and those like myself who've come from uh, a more ecological perspective, this is where these two things to cover, come together, where we understand that ourselves as humans as part of the living world. We are part of the living world and part of our error has been seeing ourselves as disconnected from and not part of that world. So the subject and the object come together, that we need deep critical reflectivity. We need to we need to ask deeper questions about what is the intrinsic nature of our, of our system, of, of the planet. And this is where in the Marine Collab, for example, we are really asking what, why should we value the ocean? It's not just for our economic gain, it is also for in, its intrinsic beauty, its intrinsic nature. So how do we bring in what we might call some of those spiritual dimensions? These are all part of taking a systems view. That, that, that they're not just about the analysis, the, the need to analyze. It's not just about the soft systems. It's also about these life processes, the regenerative, the wholeness of our life processes as well. So a systems view really comes also, we need to ask ourselves, even when working in a systems view, what is the worldview we want to bring to this? What, what are we bringing to our change making? And we need to recognize that, you know, systems are ever in change, they're ever in dynamic movement from, um, from seeds, you know, from new seeds to how they're cultivated and germinated to uh, forests that are uh, abundant and alive, but also recognize that forests collapse, uh, that, that nature actually naturally uh, moves and change, that, that, things, that things don't stay the same forever. So there's, there's questions we might raise when we take this living system to you about how change is constant, how change is constantly moving, how energy is moving through the system. And this also has implications for how we might understand our change making, that things are, are moving, are, are changing through different cycles. So how does this inform how we create change? 
Worldviews matter in the process and outcomes of systems change. So there's something about a worldview that informs how we analyze, how we look at kind of maybe more traditional science, how we bring that worldview. But there's a really big question here. And one of my big, one of my big um, points I want to make today is that systems change is not just about understanding the what of the system. It's really about how we inform the how we create change and how do we bring that to the work uh, of, of, of change making in, in issues like marine. So putting a systems change approach into practice is like an iceberg and it's quite a nice analogy for those of you who work in the marine world. Although actually I was on a call yesterday with those in the Philippines and they've They've never, they've never seen an iceberg or it doesn't really resonate with them. And we are starting to use a, a metaphor of a volcano as well. But the idea being that there is things underneath the surface um, that often what we see in, in the work in the world is often just the tip of the iceberg, the top of, of top of the work. So systems change tools and frameworks are kind of what a lot of people think about when they think about systems change. But it's only a fraction of what true systems practice is about. It's only a little bit of what it is. We need to also embrace what it means to develop a whole set of new capabilities in our change work. How do we develop different ways of operating and working to ultimately enable us, uh, ourselves and our teams to see the world in a completely new way? How do we really embrace this at the worldview level, not just at the tools and frameworks level? So, as I say, systems change frameworks are powerful and through the change making approaches we've undertaken on Marine Colab and One Less and across multiple other projects, you know, we ask questions of how does change happen? Does it happen over time? Does it happen at multiple perspectives? Uh, how do we start mapping the system? How do we start seeing how the parts intersect? And Shauna, after this, we'll start talking about the One Less project uh, and, and what we did there to, to really put these, some of these tools and approaches into practice. We also need to go beyond these frameworks to, to think about the capabilities. Yes, we need to diagnose the system, um, but we also need to think about how do we collaborate? How do we innovate? How do we lead into systems change? And this is quite a complex, complicated, not complex even, complicated diagram. But the idea being is systems change has uh, multiple steps, <clears throat> excuse me, multiple steps in the process of what we do. So there's most people that sort of, as I say, think about systems changes. How do we diagnose? How do we understand the elements of the system? How do we bring analysis? So we have done that work in terms of anal analyzing what is happening both in the physical world, but really what is also happening in the social world, what is creating some of those problems. And my first image of, of the WWF example was very much a, a, an initial kind of what is the root cause? That's a very simple way of looking at it. But how do you start understanding the complexity of that. But the real key thing for systems change is then once you've got that analysis, how do you decide where, how do you make strategic decisions on where to leverage impact? What is your theory of change? How do you start looking at that from a systemic view? How do you understand how change happens so it can inform your intervention? So you can start cultivating uh, social um, systems change, looking at the social processes, the group dynamics, the change makers that, that you work with, and how do you keep iterating that? So how do you see change as an iterative process? And um, this was uh, this is a, a quote that we use. Every attempt to write a new human story converges upon just one mundane, heartbreaking problem. How shall we come together, work together, create together? How shall we organize? And I think for me, my point I'm making is in a lot of change making, we, we, we miss out on this point. We don't put enough emphasis on not just the what we need to do, but the how we need to do it. How shall we come together? How do we work together? How do we organize for change? And so at the Marine Colab, this was started about seven or eight years ago, there was um, the uh, Glus Gilbenkian UK Foundation brought together a number of, um, number of uh, CSOs, um, civil society organisations and charities who were working in the marine space and, and asked them, how are we going to apply our different capabilities and skills to this issue of marine uh, valuing the ocean and the marine environment? So ZSL was part of that, but also a number of different organisations, Flora and Fauna, and the Thames Estuary Partnership, ourselves at Forum for the Future, bringing that systems change approach. And, and this, what I really want to say, that it was, yes, about the organisations, but it was also about the participants, the people, the, the ideas of how do we start collaborating together. And over time, those people have changed. This is just the initiation. Myself and Fiona, for example, were also part of this group as it progressed and changed. So at the heart of our systems change approach, 
we were really putting collaboration there. Collaboration and the coming together, the finding of our skills and capabilities and how they work together was really the starting place. And from that, we could then think about how do we experiment? And one less, as Sean will be talking to you a moment about, was one of those key experiments that came out of that collaboration, kind of emerged. It was kind of an emergent property of um, our collaboration saying, what, how can we bring together some of these organizations? What skills and capabilities can we create in order to experiment? But any experimentation is critical for thinking about how we do we learn? How do we iterate? How do we keep that movement? And how do we also communicate, engage with policymakers, engage with the public, engage with others to communicate, engage others? So this iterative ecosystem of change was really at the heart of our systems change approach. The idea that we need to move from, a, from the current system through collaboration, experimentation, learning to really change uh, into, a, into a, a, a future system and, and start to, to innovate and create that new system. So it's very simply was kind of what we were doing at the Marine Collab. As I said at the beginning, at the heart of this was a values based approach, was really the idea is that we need to look at both ocean value, how we value the ocean and human values, how we engage people. And, and this kind of mutually reinforcing idea that the ocean and human values are, are, are together in this, that the idea that we are that we are really infor informing our change work. And this is almost values um, is very similar to world views. The values, this idea of how we value the ocean uh, and work with humans values was almost like the, 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 the beginning billiard ball that then hit across the system was affecting all the change work that we do. It was the underpinning mental model that affected the change that we wanted to see. So ultimately, systems practices should help us develop new ways of um, change making, of thinking, of seeing the world. Um, I won't go through all the different practices uh, in terms of what does a systemic practice look like, but we created uh, a, a systemic practice wheel that kind of mapped out and looked across all, all the different practices that different systems change makers were looking at very much from how do we see the system differently? How do we identify the patterns and connections? How do we work with power dynamics? How do we activate people and see different perspectives? How do we work over time? But importantly, how, does, how do we learn? How do we question our deeper assumptions? So just to bring us close near to the close now, systems change is this emergence of a new pattern of organization, a new system structure. How do we create the emergence of a new way of doing things to solve some of these complex challenges? And what I want to sort of say that Often we see systems, systems change as the outcome, the shift in the structural pattern we want to see, the systems changing outcome that we want. But systems change is also the process by which we create change, the systemic process, the collaboration, the experimentation, the engaging with others. Um, and how do we do that systemically? So that is also equally important, not just the outcome we want to create for systems change, but the way in which we create change. And this means that when we look at those worldviews, how do we create change? When we think of a more mechanical worldview, you know, we can look at levers for change. We're outcome focused. We look for innovations and solutions, the scaling up, the, the, the shifting of incentives. But a complexity worldview also asks us to look at multiple experiments. And this is what we did at the Marine Co Lab, spotting signals of change, looking into the horizon, disrupting the systems, learning and adapting and scaling out through connecting with people, the collaboration and how we do that. And the living systems, living change, living systems perspective is that how do we live with the change? And we've seen this through the pandemic. How do we know that, that, that the world, and we'll see it even more with climate change, the world is constantly being disruptive. So how do we work with purpose, with intention, with this idea of what's the potential of the system? How do we not just work with uh, experimentation, but also how do we cultivate the capacity for evolution? The idea that systems are regenerative, that we need to develop the capacity of the system to, to sustain itself, to, to constantly evolve and to move? How do we create the conditions and ways of organizing and relating for change? And this requires us to continually learn, not just learn once in that cycle, but to continually learn. So how do these different worldviews, quite a lot to take in there, I know, start informing our change making? And what does this start to say about conservation? It's not just a conservation, therefore, it's not just about the physical world. Um, it's also about the cultural, the structural. It's about social change. It's about working with the how, not just focusing on the what, but focusing more on the how we create change and exploring the underlying assumptions about how change happening in our living systems, our worldviews. 
and um, which might challenge even the con concept of conservation. The idea, I'll just leave you with a provocation, the idea that, you know, the sustainability and conservation is perhaps not enough in the world as we see it, that we need to start thinking about how we work with living systems, the more generative and just approaches to change making as well. So that hopefully gives you a bit of an overview of systems change, a bit of an idea of some of the concepts, quite big, uh, big framing. And I'll leave Shauna next to give you a bit of an, uh, a, an example of how we started applying that on a, a real uh, marine uh, issue. So thank you very much. Real. OK, so good morning, all. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so yes, my name is Shauna Jordan and I work at the Zoological Society of London in the Marine and Freshwater Conservation Team. Um, and I joined ZSL during the pandemic to work on the One Less campaign, which was a project that ran from January 2016 to January 2022 this year. Um, and it strove to change the way that Londoners drink water, shifting behaviours away from single use plastic water bottles towards refilling for the sake of the ocean. So just to kick us off with some impact stats from the project. So together with collaborators, the One Less campaign eliminated 9 million single use plastic items. Um, we dispensed almost 1 million refills from newly installed drinking fountains. And we removed 137,000 plastic bottles from the banks of the River Thames. And so the project ran for six years in total. And in that time, it received over 1.4 million pounds in funding. And it was always designed to be a time pound uh, experiment. Uh, it was using systems change approaches to catalyze a shift in, in the hydration system in London. And by the end of the project, um, we'd really reached a, a kind of tipping point where elements in the system were beginning to shift. Um, and it's now other players in our London wide network who are sustaining and scaling further change. So when considering ocean plastic pollution, amongst many other global issues, there's increasing recognition that a systems change approach is required. And so in the final year of the One Less project, uh, we launched our own practical guide for tackling ocean pollution at source, um, and it's available online on our website. Um, and this guide is aimed really at anyone who is looking to catalyze systemic change around a chosen conservation issue. And the guide contains a step by step approach to using systems change methodologies, and it refers to the One Less project throughout as a living case study. So you've got those examples there as you go through. Um, and the guide recommends what we found to be the, the real key steps to driving systemic change. And so for the next 10 minutes, I'd just like to take you on a whistle stop tour um, of the guide and I can touch on how the One Less team worked through some of those really important steps. So one of the first recommendations from the guide is to set up a team based on a shared intention and desire to affect change and then establish your project scope and, and the boundaries of the system that you're trying to change. So starting with the One Less team, um, as mentioned by Anna, uh, One Less was born from the Marine Collab. Um, and the team was made up of four different organisations, which each brought uh, different skill sets to the partnership. So we had ZSL, who are leaders in marine science and conservation with expertise in ocean pollution. And um, then we had Thames Estuary Partnership, who connect people, sectors and ideas for the benefit of the Thames and her communities. We also had IPSO, who bring together science and communications to increase our understanding of the role of the ocean at that earth system level. And then we had Forum for the Future, um, who are experts in systems analysis, working with business, government, civil society to solve really complex sustainability challenges. And our shared intention as a team was to tackle ocean plastic pollution at source. And single use plastic water bottles are a major contributor to the ocean plastic problem. Uh, Londoners alone get through a whopping 1.2 billion single use plastic water bottles every single year, despite clean drinking water being readily available from the tap. So with London being a coastal city directly connected to the ocean via the iconic River Thames, uh, London was the ideal start point for our team to drive systemic change at a city level. And so the team decided then to use the single use plastic water bottle as our flagship item 
to represent that enormous issue of unnecessary disposable plastic in the city and to help people to understand that everyday behaviours such as buying a bottle of water do have an impact on the ocean and that small changes do make a big difference. So from there, the team had to then set boundaries around the system that they were trying to work with. So we decided that rather than work with waste management um, and supply chains and water bottle producers um, and trying to get those to prioritise reuse, rather than that, actually, we were better placed as a team to focus on refill infrastructure. So enabling behaviour change at the individual, the organisational and the policy level and reframing how Londoners value the ocean. So after this, then we identified stakeholders across the system, um, highlighting those real key players who are both interested in engaging and highly influential. So for one less, this was an iterative exercise that the team kept coming back to over the years. Um, and we started off by listing the key sectors and organisations already involved in our hydration system, as well as those who are not already involved, but would be essential to engage with. So this is such as the, the Greater London Authority. And then we plotted these stakeholders on a graph to visualise their influence in our system against their interest in our, in our mission. And this really helped the team to prioritise who they would engage with. So then next we needed to diagnose the hydration system in London. So looking at behaviours, enablers of change, barriers to change, who the key actors are in that system and innovations. Um, and then from there we could map the system. So literally put this all down in an illustration and visualise all those different levels and complex dynamics that Anna was talking about. And then from there we could present this back to our stakeholders and sense check our understanding. And now this process involved um, lots of interviews um, to understand how different stakeholders contribute to and perceive the problem of single use plastic bottles. And if they're trying to address it, then how? So we invited stakeholders to a workshop to share our findings and to sense check our understanding of the system that we were looking to shift. And this whole process was really useful for the team. Um, it helped us to question our own assumptions about London's water bottle problem and begin to consider where and how we could intervene to create change. So having established um, a fair illustration of the system through our diagnosis and mapping process, we could then start to identify key leverage points and decide the best areas to intervene in the system for change. So this process uh, combined identifying opportunities for action, which are the ones in the, the yellow boxes, um, and then reflecting on our own assets and resources as a project team. And from here, we considered what our interventions could look like and which combination of interventions would be the most effective in applying pressure at multiple points in London's hydration system. So from here, then we could engage and energize people around the project and experiment with different interventions to test out those different leverage points, those different opportunities for action. So um, some examples of our interventions that we experimented with. Um, so the Fountain Fund, uh, firstly, so our diagnosis process revealed that a major barrier to refilling was in fact limited access to refill points when out and about in London. So in 2018, we worked with the mayor's office in London to launch a pilot project, installing a network of 29 drinking fountains across London. And by January 2022, these had dispensed almost 1 million refills, as I mentioned at the start. And the positive uptake of these initial fountains then catalyzed a £5 million fund by the Mayor of London and Thames Water to help deliver over 100 further public fountains across London. Next, we have the, the Pioneer Network. So following our initial stakeholder workshop in 2016, one less engaged in ongoing conversations with many different organisations around this issue of single-use plastic water bottles in London. And these conversations highlighted the challenges and the opportunities within that system. Um, and so we wanted to pull this all together, all this dialogue together under one umbrella um, to provide a platform for these organisations to connect with each other, showcase their learnings and their findings. And as a result, we created um, what we called a pioneer network. And this was businesses, councils, local authorities, academic institutions, um, emerging innovators um, and landmark venues in London who were all ahead of the curve 
in voluntarily reducing and eliminating plastic water bottles or encouraging new ways to drink water. So one less than organised, um, convened and facilitated annual learning events with this network. And then collectively, by the end of the project, the network had eliminated nine million single use plastic items, of which six million were single use plastic water bottles. Um, our other interventions also um, were based around collaborating with other organisations working on plastic pollution. So bringing learning and influence together to create wider change. And examples include Refill London and Plastic Free Parliament, um, which we did with Surface Against Sewage. Building robust evidence of the marine plastic issue along, along London's River Thames was also really key. Um, so one less partnered with Thames 21 and citizen scientists to better understand the scale of London's plastic bottle problem by conducting regular bottle counts along the tidal Thames. And we found that plastic water bottles made up nearly 50% of all plastic drink bottles that were found um, during this research. And in the six years of working on this programme, over 137,000 bottles were collected by over 800 volunteers. Another key intervention point for the team um, was around policy. So we used the evidence um, from the Thames Bottle Monitoring Programme to drive policy change over the years at both the London and the national level. So one less provided evidence to the London Assembly Environment Committee and then later to the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee. And then subsequent reports quoted one less and called on both the Mayor of London and the national government to take action to reduce single use plastic water bottle usage in the city. And the Mayor of London then commissioned one less to carry out further research on the plastic bottle issue, uh, which then led to a partnership between one less and the Mayor to install that network of drinking fountains that I mentioned. And a commitment was then included in the new London Environment Strategy to reduce single-use plastic water bottles, and this was later echoed within the broader London Plan 2021. Then at the beginning of last year, of 2021, we produced a joint statement um, calling on London mayoral candidates to take further action on this issue, and we were really, really pleased to receive 40 signatories on this statement and great backing from a number of election candidates. So we also found another really key step in driving systemic change was to communicate strategically about our, other acti about our activities and draw a connection between human and ocean values. So the overarching goal of One Less Communications was to establish a sense of connection to the ocean whilst living in an urban, non-coastal environment. And that name, One Less, was adopted really as, as an antidote to that feeling of paralysis um, that the plastic issue tends to produce for, for many of us. So the thinking was, if you refill, that's one less bottle that will join the problem. And that's a solution which is it's manageable and everybody can do it and have an impact. So individuals were encouraged to make a personal pledge to go single use plastic water bottle free. And we mounted pledging stations at London events, including in store events at Selfridges, but also at international ocean events, including um, the United Nations Ocean Conference, which then resulted in the UN headquarters in New York promoting refill alternatives, removing single-use plastic water bottles from all their meeting rooms, and then completely removing single-use plastic from its catering supplies. And our communications took a major evolution um, with our campaign, Hello London, Goodbye Ocean Plastic. Um, which pivoted to targeting incomers to London, making them aware that London is a city that refills. So this comms campaign was dual purpose, encouraging tourists and tourist providers to get on board with the One Less movement, whilst reinforcing the position for Londoners themselves, i.e. this is who we are, we refill. And the campaign had over 20 partnering organisations, <coughs> excuse me, and um, our messages reached over 5 million people. So we found one of the, the final key steps to sustain impact over time was to undertake a system re-diagnosis. So revisiting this process from the very beginning of the project meant that the One Less team could identify changes in the system and adapt, monitor and evaluate interventions in response. So as we learned through One Less, enabling systemic change is a process that happens over time and it can be easier to create momentum for change 
than to sustain it. So at the end of 2019, which was over three years into the project, um, we recognised that the system we were working in had been changing. So you might recall there'd been a, a really large media push around plastic pollution following the likes of Sky Ocean Rescue and, and Blue Planet 2. Um, civil society organisations were, were putting pressure on governments and some enabling policies were emerging at a local and global level. And organisations were actually starting to tackle some of their plastic procurement and waste strategies. And then, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic added a completely new layer of complexity to our system as well. So at this point, our team undertook a re-diagnosis of the hydration system in 2020 to update our 2016 map. And we sought to find out if our original leverage points, those opportunities for action, to see if they had shifted, um, to see if the barriers to change had themselves changed um, and whether new barriers had arisen and where new opportunities for action might lie. So the final recommendation that, that's made in the One Less Practical Guide um, is to recognise that the project team does not need to, co to continue forever in the same form. So for One Less, following the re-diagnosis process in 2020, the team had started to reach that tipping point in catalyzing change. And from this re-diagnosis, we identified new opportunities for sustaining action in London. Um, and we illustrated these in our final output, which was a roadmap for London. And this infographic that you can see on the screen, this is from a, a really short three, three, four page doc, uh, which spells out some really exciting ideas for driving further change in London around this issue. And it's a document for anyone and everyone who may have power to act in one of the many areas that we've identified across the system. And so with that, we wrapped up the project in January of this year, and we've passed the baton over to our wider network now. We've shared our learnings and our findings and our recommendations for continuing this movement, furthering London as an ocean-friendly city. So in terms of a project team, um, we're now looking to replicate the approach of One Less London in other locations around the world taking the systems change approach, diagnosing the, the plastic problem elsewhere, working in collaboration to stem the flow of plastic pollution into the ocean. So to this end, ZSL has an existing project in the Chagos Archipelago funded by Darwin, uh, which is looking to mitigate the impact of plastic pollution on sea turtles. And we've also secured funding from the John Elliman Foundation, and we're just waiting for confirmation of our Darwin Plus result. Uh, for a new project that takes the one less systems change approach and learnings from London and from Chagos to the UK overseas territories of Ascension and St Helena in the Atlantic Ocean. And we're really um, open to discussing other opportunities for scaling this approach. We, we always love to chat, so please do get in, in touch with any thoughts, any ideas, feedback, suggestions, whatever you may have. Um, my contact details will be available through the um, event organisers. So with that, um, I'll stop talking uh, and say thank you so, so much for listening. And I hope that you do enjoy the rest of the symposium. I'd like to start today with a story that begins nearly 10 years ago when I found myself sitting on a long sandy beach along the Kenyan coastline, listening to a woman named Susan tell me that I had cost her her job. I was a graduate student at the time studying the perceptions of community-based marine protected areas just north of Mombasa, Kenya. And I was using a participatory research method called Photo Voice, where people take and use photographs to anchor their stories about the relationships they have with each other, with nature, and with conservation. And I was hearing these really inspiring stories about a community that had come together to create an association that now managed a small marine protected area, and they were truly benefiting from it. But I met this woman named Susan. She was a fish trader in the region, and she encouraged me to speak to some of her neighbors. They had a really different story to tell about this project. And in this conversation, I learned an entirely different side of the story. I learned the story of a community that had been excluded from this protected area and were feeling the costs every day as they were no longer able to access their primary fishing grounds. But a month later, Susan was telling me that just facilitating that conversation with these neighbors of hers increased their mistrust of her, so much so that they chose to stop selling fish to her. She kept telling me she wasn't too worried, she was trading in a new community now, and really thought this conservation project was important, that it was critical to protect the resources now and into the future. 
It didn't change what happened that day though. And I tell you this story today because for me, it's still one of the most humbling stories of my career and illustrates how messy conservation work truly is. The systems where we work have histories and stories that we don't always see and complex dynamics that we can't always predict. And this story still to this day, I feel illustrates the first of eight principles that we distilled in a book on systems thinking for conservation that underscores that we're all part of these systems that we're striving to change. And like I did, sometimes we can underestimate the power that we have in any given moment as our simple presence or absence can be an intervention in and of itself. And so fast forward to today, I work at WWF to support our mission, which is to live in harmony with nature. And the central question that drives my work is how can we better embrace the messiness of the real world to achieve this mission and create lasting change? So today I'll explore how ideas and approaches from systems thinking can help us do that. I'll explore what I mean by systems thinking and share stories from my work and practice where we've used tools for fostering systems change to help uncover different assumptions and ideas about the world we live in. We'll talk about what this might mean for conservation in the future, and I hope that you'll join me in realizing that bringing systems thinking to conservation is truly a journey, but it's an accessible journey, and that can begin with just simply cultivating the intention to be present with every step that we take in our work. The systems thinking has been defined as a way of understanding that recognizes the connections and complexity of the world, and it's not a new idea. We can trace this way of thinking back to many of the indigenous knowledge systems in the world and across the many Western scientific disciplines that many of us are trained in, in conservation. But still to this day, there's a limited integration of this way of thinking and working into how we plan and evaluate and implement conservation projects and programs. So one of my favorite and most simple tools for thinking in systems is the iceberg model. It gets us to you know, metaphorically look beneath the surface. And I'll walk through an example about how we can use the iceberg model to ask good questions about the systems we work in. So imagine a mine opens up along a river. If we ask why we see that happening, we may start to uncover a pattern of mines opening up along a river. We can interrogate further to explore the underlying structures that may be enabling that pattern. It could be there's a new tax law in effect that helps encourage the opening of mines and beneath that a mental model that is deeply rooted in those in power that underscores the importance of economic development above all else. And while this is a rather simplistic example, tools like the iceberg can help us ask good questions, challenge our assumptions and better understand the problems that we face so that we can identify more inclusive and effective solutions. So today I'll share a few stories from my work at WWF where we've tried to bring tools and concepts from systems thinking into our projects and programs. I'll share the entry point that we had for doing this and what happened as a result. So the first one I'll invite you to coastal Madagascar, where communities have for a very long time been at the front lines of protecting critical habitats like coral reefs and mangroves pictured here. This video is from a visit we made before the pandemic where I got the opportunity to learn firsthand about these efforts and saw how truly many stakeholders work together to realize the goals of protecting these beautiful places. So our entry point into the system was a new flexible grant that we had to support interventions and programs that were designed to enable community-based conservation and support its scaling at a, national, at a national level. And so in the spirit of systems thinking, we saw an opportunity, as we sometimes say, to slow down, to speed up and really take the time to understand the challenges and opportunities that existed within community-based conservation from the many different perspectives of those involved in, in creating the system that we were striving to support. So we designed a learning process that we carried out over a couple of months that ended with a large multi-stakeholder dialogue in the capital. And we used a lot of different methods to elucidate different perceptions, including qualitative interviews, reviewing scientific literature, and then we all had the opportunity to come together. The dialogue was attended by close to 100 people. We had representatives from many different groups, community associations, nonprofits, governments. And we had lots of different discussions and exercises that were designed to help you know, bring this community together to realize the different histories that people had in the system, where they were today, and the hopes they had for the future. We use many tools, but one that really helped target that future question is something called rapid cycle prototyping. So the 
goal of this particular exercise was to try to understand the many different visions that people in the system had for community-based conservation. And so small groups were tasked with, with creating a vision. They were asked to build a, a vision of what they wanted the future to look like using whatever materials were available to them on the table, as you can see pictured here. And then the groups were invited to present their models to one another. They presented them and then they were invited to combine them. And so each iteration of this process invited the participants to really challenge what was a critical component of the future and how could it come alongside the other visions that they were learning about within the system. So at the end, we had two very large models that actually showed two very different visions of the future. One focused on really getting the process of transferring the rights to manage resources from the government to the communities done well. The other model was a little bit more kind of aspirational and focused on a future where you know, people were thriving, communities were thriving, ecosystems were thriving. And there was a moment where there was this collective realization that while we were all working towards similar things, there were different aspects of the vision that needed more work than others. And different people value different aspects of that vision more than others. So our big lesson there, I think from, from my perspective, we thought, you know, by understanding the policies that the process for kind of transferring management rights was strong and already in place. But we learned that day, especially from the perspectives of community associations, that there was still a lot of work to be done to make sure that that process worked in practice. And for them, achieving that vision would be achieving the vision of community-based conservation. Let's move to another story. So this is one that has been on many of our minds for the last few years. And the question driving this particular story was, how can we in conservation help reduce the risk of zoonotic disease spillover? to prevent future pandemics. And so many conservation organizations were having similar conservation conversations in early 2020 about the relationship between zoonotic disease spillover and conservation. And while some of the conversations were more exploratory, many people were using the window of opportunity as a moment to elevate some of the conservation goals and programs we've been working towards for a long time. But we saw an opportunity to kind of dig a little bit deeper and understand this relationship in a little bit more of a nuanced way. And our entry point was to create a strategy. There was a, a lot of interest at that moment to really understand what role could conservation play that would actually work at the heart of this problem and help reduce the risk of zoonotic disease spillover and challenge the assumptions about what pathways, programs, and approaches would be the best way to achieve this. So we had about a month to design this strategy and we knew that the best way of doing this would be to engage the knowledge of, the, of those that we work with in different corners of the world. So we crafted what we called a design sprint that was designed to bring together these different perspectives to better understand these links that we, we knew were likely different in different places of the world. And so this month long process, we engaged about 50 people virtually and it involved many different groups of people playing different roles. And while we use many different tools in this process, I'll speak about just two. So throughout this virtual experience, we designed a series of small group discussions with whom we called experts. And these experts brought lots of you know, different forms of knowledge to the table. Some were those who had been working really at the forefront of, of you know, in communities where zoonotic disease spillover is a high risk. Others brought you know, years of academic or um, you know, disciplinary, disciplinary knowledge on the different aspects of the system that we were trying to, to interrogate. And so we set up a series of conversations where the program team that was at the kind of heart of driving the strategy forward would have really informal and open conversations with these experts. They would ask questions such as, you know, what was the history of the system that they work in? What were some of the factors that they thought were key for contributing to the risk of zoonotic disease spillover? And importantly, what role could an organization like WWF play in this space going forward? Of course, we learned that the world is complex. There is no one size fits all solution, but we learned a lot about the different relationships that weren't really on our radar yet. And we left with many more questions than, than we had um, when we started. But all this knowledge was then channeled into our next tool. One of the most common tools used in systems thinking is systems mapping or causal loop diagram, which invites participants to physically identify and draw the links between different nodes in a system, 
interrogate the relationships, the different feedbacks, thresholds, and use the, the knowledge that you know, a group brings to the table to construct a mental model of a system. This image that you're seeing expanding here on the screen is actually a, a real life depiction of the model that we created. As you can tell, it got quite complex. And to make sense of this, we created the large model. We broke it up into little pieces and discussed it further in small groups. Really at the heart of this whole process was interrogating, 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 and asking good questions, challenging our assumptions. And finally, in the end, after we sort of broke this model apart, we were able to create sort of a simple narrative about the system and about how we thought change could happen. And this map is still actually used to help communicate the, um, the initiative. And we created actually a series of these maps that have been used to help inform conversations in different corners of the world where these dynamics play out in really different ways. So these two stories I shared with you today, I know they veer from today's theme of oceans plastics, but I hope that by exploring these stories, you can start to think about how you might bring some of these tools and methods into the problems that you tackle in your work. So to end today, I'll share some of the lessons that I've taken away from doing this work um, at WWF, bringing systems thinking into practice. The first is that there can be many entry points to create change that we seek in individuals, in organizations, and systems. The two stories I shared, they focused on you know, very different systems and had very different entry points. It was just a place where we found ourselves. And what we were able to do with the different tools that we harnessed were to just help a group of people have a collective realization and a mind shift about how the world worked. And that was able to kind of unlock different pathways for solutions that we might take to create change in the world. This relates to another principle um, from the Art of Systems Change on co-creating with intention. The issues that we all tackle today in conservation are deeply intertwined with the social, political, and economic systems in which we all live and work. And that means that there are different stakeholders with very different values, very different visions for the future. So true co-creation requires that we create the space to negotiate those different needs and trade-offs. And it's important to remember that that takes time. The second key takeaway is that changing systems doesn't need to be overly complex. I talk about systems change a lot, and I've noticed that people tend to glaze over or shut down when we start to talk about complexity. But what I've learned is that sometimes taking a step forward in creating systems change just sometimes needs the right mindset or the right mind shift or the right group of people to start challenging assumptions to really begin. And that's what all these tools are really designed to help us help us do. These are distilled in a new guide called the Craft of Systems Change. And they're all designed to be easy to pick up and useful in day-to-day -day work. And sometimes these tools like semi-structured interviews are practices that we already engage in in our work in conservation. But sometimes just naming them as tools and recognizing the transformative potential that they have allows us to use them more wisely. And it allows us to deliberately engage unexpected allies in our work and bring them along our journey to create systems change. And on that note, one of the important mind shifts for doing this kind of work, in my opinion, is that we need to get better at recognizing that we are on a journey. The work that we do in conservation is really hard and it often involves challenging these global mental models about how the world can and should work. So if we think about our work as a journey and the tools and approaches that we use to design and plan and evaluate our programs as compasses that can guide us, we can become more agile and adaptive and open to new ideas and able to learn about what works and what doesn't and really navigate our, our journey forward. So in practice, we've argued that this requires, we really do reimagine how we do conservation strategy development and evaluation, recognizing that the linear conservation plan with concrete milestones that we can predict years in advance may not be serving us any longer. So in the craft of systems change, we introduce what we call the systems journey. And it emphasizes three interconnected phases, which encourage us to engage meaningfully with the systems and people around us, explore the many different futures that we may aspire towards and learn our way towards a future that can work for everyone. And this journey can be facilitated using many of the tools that we talked about today, often in different configurations, depending on the needs and the context that you find yourself in. And truly moving the conservation sector towards this more fluid way of working will inevitably take time. But I do believe that with every step we take, we create new opportunities to challenge the norms and structures around us 
and this can inch us closer towards achieving that transformational change that we seek. So I'll leave you here today. I invite you all to check out some of the resources we've been developing for systems thinking in conservation at worldwildlife.org slash systems. And thank you for letting me share my stories with you today. And I'm delighted to be here in this uh, meeting. And uh, although I have not really worked on ocean plastics, but the source of ocean plastics, uh, one of the longest river in India and one of the most important river that flows through one of the most densely populated regions of the world, the Ganga River. And I will just tell you what we are doing to contain this whole issue of uh, plastics going through the rivers into the ocean, but by engaging the local communities. So we, uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, right. yes, Rishi, we, can, is visible. We, we can see it well, thank you. So basically our project focuses uh, to, uh, you know, uh, look, uh, to restore the values, the ecological values of the Ganga River Basin by involving multiple stakeholders and establish a link between a science policy and uh, you know, the conservation practice. So basically we uh, uh, have developed a scientific base. We are doing a lot of capacity building work and we are also developing community-based outreach programs. If you look at the uh, freshwater species, one of the major causes for their decline is habitat loss and degradation, which is the decline in the quality and quantity of water available in the river ecosystems. If you look at the Ganga River, it is the national river of our country. It is a most sacred river for, the, for you know, Indians and Hindus all around the world. It is a very uh, amazing river in terms of the extraordinary variations in terms of altitude, climate, land use, the, uh, you know, the biodiversity, the social, cultural and economic, uh, you know, the regions and values that it flows through and to which it contributes a lot. It is a transboundary river uh, flowing uh, from India into Bangladesh and actually the basin covers about 26% of the landmass of the country. 40% uh, of India's population actually depends on this river and it this basin actually caters to 30% of the water resources of the country. A large number of dams uh, and uh, minor and ma major irrigation projects have been built or are being proposed for this river. Now, as you know that cremations along the rivers is a very important traditional and religious practices. So it is, it, there's a very rough estimate which says that 40,000 cremations per day happen along the Ganga River. And a lot of sewage also goes into the river through various means. It could be, you know, untreated uh, sewage through the uh, towns, cities, industries, and so on uh, through, you know, the pollutants going through the agricultural fields, etc. It is very rich, despite all these pressures, a river very rich in biodiversity. Five species of aquatic mammals, including otters, the Gangetic dolphins, the gharial, you know, the crocodile, which is restricted only to the Gangetic river basin, the Gavilis gangeticus. So this is uh, you no know, one, and then a large number of species of amphibians, birds, etc. Majority of these species have been listed as critical, you know, uh, critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable under the IUCN status. Now, if you look at the factors that contribute to uh, uh, the, you know, declining or degradation of the river's biodiversity, plastic pollution is one of water pollution. Pollution is a major issue and plastic is again a major factor here. So if you look at, uh, you know, this is showing, you know, the pilgrims uh, in this on special occasions in the Ganga River. So you can imagine, and these figures are in millions. So despite the fact that uh, the, uh, you know, the Gangetic Basin has about 900 people per square kilometer, apart from that on special days and occasions, you can see the number of people who are visiting its banks with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, material for offerings and uh, invariably a lot of plastic comes here. In terms of uh, plastic, you can see the kinds of uh, plastic which are, there's a study which was conducted in 2019. And these are studies from the lower Ganga, a, a part of the Ganga. And you can see a large part of it is actually the microplastics per kg of sediment. And it is a lot, if you can see in most of these areas. Sorry, it's, it has to come down, yeah. So if you see, 
considering all these issues and it's a very big project but i'll just focus on our part that we created a cadre of local communities which are known as ganga praheris guardians of the ganga and these people uh, actually this, this is the distribution of the ganga praheris in the ganga basin and uh, there are about 2800 ganga praheris right now 60% of whom are women and uh, basically uh, for them we have actually uh, created a database where each ganga prahari's details are listed and you can approach them through uh, this database and you can check in how they are trained and what they are doing for conservation of the river this is uh, the loop of our database and it was launched by the highest level in the country and a large number of training program so basically in this whole approach you know including for plastics plastic is just one of the concerns that we are taken because we have taken a huge survey with the national geographic society and zsl also was a partner there uh, the source to uh, sea to source expedition and we could uh, get some information about the plastic uh, pollution in the ganga river so we we have actually focused on building up of the human capital and the social social capital and we assume that once we are able to build up these two forms of capital uh, to a certain level other things are available you know the financial capital is available in the larger landscape the other things are there but we have largely focused on capacity building awareness skill development and also a large number of livelihood opportunities of other people so the idea is to link conservation and livelihoods in a way that people are able to earn their livelihoods through a intact riverine ecosystem rather than by degrading the ecosystem and we've used a variety of means to actually do this we've done you know uh, rallies you know walkathons we call them padyatra then during the kumbh which is one of the largest gathering of humanity in the on the earth you know the kumbh mela where over 10 million people come on the banks of the ganga river at Pira at two places it takes place one is at hardwar and one is at the G confluence of ganga and its tributary yamuna so there it's a huge gathering and it's a challenge to do any kind of conservation but our ganga trained people were actually able to create awareness and ensure and minimize the use of plastic you can see how the vendors are you know using plastics and they are being informed and they are being offered uh, Uh, you know paper bags and cloth bags to you know replace with uh, plastic uh, stuff that they are using then again regular cleaning activities this is what they are using as discarded fishing nets as dustbins so you know we talk about the uh, pollution which is coming from discarded fishing nets plastic nets so this is being taken care of by reusing them right now in a very crude way but again we are working on this and you can see this is one of the prominent areas Uh, uh the dol gangetic dolphin sanctuary the only sanctuary for the gangetic dolphin in the country this is the before situation and the after situation after this particular area was adopted by the ganga praheris and this is the group of ganga praheris and they were able to ensure cleanliness and that is how they are doing you know they've created these water dustbins and they are they've created it a no plastic and a no pollution zone so these efforts at the local uh, level are really paying off again this wi nmcg project on the plastic pollution assessment and awareness uh, we uh, you know traverse the entire length of the river and we documented more than 50000 pieces of trash using the marine debris tracker held a lot, large number of community workshops on solutions and causes of plastic waste and what very interestingly what we found was the biggest contributor was a single use plastic and what was the reason for the use of this single use plastic it was basically the poverty of the people which you know uh, forced them to buy uh, you know things in small quantities with plastic uh, wrappers and so on and of course we uh, have collected over a large number of samples for analysis of microplastics some of this study has already been published others are on the way of being published large number of focus group interviews household surveys and perceptions were uh, there and even in this survey more than 100 ganga praheris were part of this team at the local level so they were there as assessors so you you can understand their level of understanding about plastic pollution the whole process was that they were participating as assessors but at the same time their own capacity and awareness was being enhanced and this is what has percolated into the community and we were uh, you know ensuring that at each site it was the local ganga praheris who were involved in this whole exercise along with the ngs group 
and now again we are uh, with the zoological society of london we are uh, we have a project uh, at on buyback and recycling of uh, fishing nets for strengthening the socio ecological resilience of fishing communities living along the ganges through inclusive and equitable flight uh, supply chains basically we want to support less plastic and more fish so this is initiative which has just taken off and maybe in another couple of weeks our personnel will be on the ground to actually start working on this again we've used a lot of social media uh, like radio television instagram facebook everything you name it it's there that we've used to create awareness about all kinds of pollution but plastic has been a major issue here lot of exhibitions you know where we display what happens you know if the plastic uh, enters into the you know the systems of the marine species uh, or sorry the aquatic species and so on and these are being attended not only at the by the communities but the highest levels of leaders and policy makers we've used the medium of music dance and whatever to create such awareness another cadre of the future that is the bal ganga prairies is there and here we are working with a large number of schools in the ganga basin trying to create awareness trying to create scholarships awarding children for not using plastic or for you know collecting plastic and bringing it and you know that, that those kind of contests and competitions are a regular feature and these children in turn are able to uh, uh, you know uh, train or, or they are being taught various crafts and skills so that you know they are using all uh, degradable material and uh, understanding the value of not using and the possibility of not using using uh, plastics apart from that we've created a large number of uh, uh, lo uh, you know literature or awareness material in local language as well as in uh, english to create awareness uh, among the children again we have a platform for the larger community that is the pravasi ganga prairie so the global citizens if they want to be part of this initiative and now this initiative has has been upscaled to the entire ganga basin that means the ganga river and its tributaries and now we are working on six other major rivers of the country so any of you anybody who wants to be a part of it can become a pravasi ganga prairie and contribute to this platform in any way whatever is possible and this is again it's an online activity uh, online process to become a pravasi ganga prairie and people can do work from all, you know their homes they can come to india and work they can contribute financially if they want to directly to the government of india site and so on so uh, i think that is what i want to say now and if there are any questions i would be very happy to answer maybe if there's a time for a single query or so thank you could we track and follow an actual 500 milliliter plastic water bottle? Could we follow the journey that everyday plastic items take from river to ocean and ultimately reveal their final destination? I'm Alistair Davis, director of the Arabada Initiative, a UK based conservation technology research and development organization. And in this rapid research spotlight film, I'll be sharing a brief look at our bottle technology from progress to date tracking everyday plastic items. The exact same items you'd find in your local supermarket, but this time with embedded tracking technology inside. I'm also joined by Dr. Emily Duncan from the University of Exeter, who spearheaded this research. Our actual research started in India and Bangladesh as a component of the National Geographic Society's Seek to Source expedition. And this was the first time we deployed the bottle design and it looked a little bit like this. We developed a special enclosure that housed batteries in the base, a GPS antenna in the roof, and a satellite transmitter to transmit back the bottle's location every three hours. The bottle can transmit for several years and it uses the Argos satellite constellation, the same one that sea turtle researchers use to track turtles across oceans. The bottles have an antenna on the stern and float with about 50% of their enclosure body in the water. And the trick was making the internal enclosure as lightweight as possible, so as not to change or affect the normal flow that a bottle on water would take. So we're keeping the item as close as possible to a normal water bottle. And we estimate that our bottle weighs the same as a normal Coke bottle with about a quarter of the liquid left inside. Because the bottles will be pushed over by waves and have to face ocean storms, 
We also needed to ensure that they could self-write, meaning that the antenna will always face upwards. And the trick to making that work was getting the center of gravity correct. So we designed them with the heaviest part, i.e. the batteries, in the base, forcing the bottle to always orientate upwards. In our first deployment in Bangladesh in 2019, one of the bottles released traveled 2,845 kilometers, helping to validate that yes, it was possible to track actual bottles, and this opened up the possibility to do much more, leading to a release of the bottles at the G7 Summit in Cornwall in June 2021. A message in a bottle, and it's one that scientists hope will get through. They want to put a halt to sites like this, and to do that, they're trying to find out just how far plastic travels in our oceans and the impact it's having. Earlier this year, they launched seven bottles with tracking devices inside at the G7 summit in Cornwall, and now they're doing the same up north. At COP, um, we're releasing some satellite tracked plastic bottles. Uh, we know that plastic is ubiquitous in the marine environment, but really we want to show how it's influenced by tide, wave and currents. The G7 bottles had to navigate one of the world's busiest shipping lanes in the English Channel. So it's quite nerve wracking watching the bottles enter the lane, pass through and then get pushed back in the weather. Um, you'd wake up in the mornings and also see that there were major storms, there quite a few in 2021, so six metre waves were not uncommon. And this photo here shows the seven bottles together from the G7 summit deployment on day one. And I can now reveal their final destinations. So, Italy ended up on the coast of France after several months at sea. Japan ended up in the Netherlands five months later and is now in someone's back garden after being found. Germany beached near the Cornish coast and was found by a member of the public. It then spent two weeks driving about Cornwall and was kindly returned to the sea at the end of the unknown person's holiday. Well, we presume it was a holiday uh, as it visited nearly all of the local tourist attractions before getting returned to the sea where it was later found again when it re-beached further down the coast by a local surfer. So Germany had quite uh, the adventure. The USA ended up in South Wales after a large storm surge pushed it north. France ended up in Guernsey and was recovered by a volunteer beach cleaner. The UK stayed closer to home, a uh, beach near Coxford and Canada stayed close too. And later this year, we'll be releasing 30 more bottles across Singapore and Malaysia as a result of this early research. So there should be many more journeys and tracking stories to share in the near future too. Thank you very much.